ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, welcome to the second uh, uh, interview of the 2022 uh, Zoom series that we're doing. Uh, we just did post uh, last week's uh, Zoom interview um, with Brian Wills on the uh, BGS um, uh, YouTube channel, which is a free a free channel. Um, we've got so almost 300 people signed up and uh, these things got watched anywhere from 50 times up to uh, a couple of thousand times. So it's a good opportunity um, for you to go in and pick up some of the uh, lectures we did last year. And uh, I look forward in this year to uh, doing perhaps um, uh, as many as 40 to put up online. So uh, this being the second one, first couple of weeks next week, uh, Paul Severance and I will uh, talk about uh, the Peninsula campaign and the seven days. And uh, the week after that, um, um, uh, we'll have uh, Bob Jenkins talking about Atlanta Five. And I believe the week after that, we'll uh, probably have Scotty Patchen talking about uh, War George Washington and um, French and Indian War, and then right after that, we'll have a uh, Gordon Ray, and we'll just to keep on trucking. So uh, we're going to be pretty busy now. I see what Karen has done up here is she has put up our YouTube channel up there, and um, you can see uh, on the screen that there's just a whole bunch of um, uh, good stuff in there. And um, uh, if you uh, like what you hear tonight, tell your friends what they missed and. Uh, send them to the YouTube channel. These things will be up uh, indefinitely. We have these going all the way back to uh, January of last year, and we'll keep them up. And um, uh, they're absolutely free. Uh, I see in front of me the March to the Sea with John Durden, which we're going to start in about eight days or so, uh, is up there. Um, that's that's a good interview. So I think you'll enjoy those a great deal, and uh, I know you'll enjoy the series. Now, just to review the the bidding for um, for how we run this thing, um, Steve Wise and I are going to sit and talk for about um, uh, forty five minutes or so back and forth. And um, uh, if you want to talk uh, or if you have a question, uh, there is a uh, button up in the top of your Zoom that um, I think. Uh, it's uh, under the more button, and if you hit more, uh, then you can hit chat, and uh, you can also raise a hand if you wish to to uh, get my attention. Uh, if you have a question, just go ahead and type that question briefly in there, and I will look at it while Steve is talking, and I'll determine when and where to phase it in to the conversation. It might be relevant right at the time and I'll pop it right in. Um, or it may be something I want to raise a little later I, or I may want to hold till the Q&A at the latter part of the, of the program. The program is going to go until nine o'clock plus or minus five minutes. Um, if uh, there's no dialogue or questions from you all, then um, uh, we'll We'll wrap it up after Steve answers the last question at about five minutes to the hour. If he's going a little bit past nine and there's no questions, when he finishes that, we'll wrap it at that point. Um, if Steve is able and is willing, uh, we'll allow a 10-minute open mic period right after we finish for folks who maybe didn't want to ask a question publicly or wanted to ask something privately or just want to say, Hi to Steve or me. Uh, we'll have it open for no more than 10 minutes. At 9.15 Eastern, we're done and we shut down. Uh, so that would be the end of the program. Now, uh, what the thrust of this uh, talk tonight is uh, going to be about is uh, Steve's uh, uh, tour next month that is going to be Sherman going through South Carolina. And what's Important about this is that uh, for those of you who are looking for a thematically uh, cogent um, 
campaign study, uh, we actually, the, the stars just lined up this way. Within 13 months, we will do Sherman entirely from Sherman's March to the Sea through the surrender in sequential order. So uh, in about a week and a half's time, we start um, Sherman's March to the Sea uh, that John Durden is going to do. And then about a month after that, Steve will pick up Sherman in Savannah and he, he'll take Sherman all the way to the North Carolina border through Sherall and will pick up Potter's Raid as an afterthought. And then in February of, uh, of um, 2023, Wade Sokolowski will do his program to the bitter end, which is Sherman entering um, uh, North Carolina through the negotiations and the surrender at Greensboro. And so you will be able over a period of about 12 days, if you are so inclined to see this wall to wall and understand that whole campaign to be able to do it and do it in sequence. What we've done to encourage that a little bit is if somebody wants to attend all three parts of that, um, uh, we're offering a 25% discount off of the third program in the series. So if you go to one and you go to two and you come to three, you'll get about 150 to $200 off your registration to do the third part. So you can do all three, but the discount's only good for people who are doing all three parts. And right now, I think we've got three or four people who have already signed up to do that. So uh, it is part of a very uh, deliberate process that we intended to do. And um, it is part two. So, uh, and in and of itself, it's well worth attending. I mean, if you, if you like what you hear, if you're interested, you certainly ought to look to attend this thing because uh, you're going to see some things that just flat out or not on other people's tours because most people stay in the deep water and they don't look at things like South Carolina and so forth other than perhaps Charleston. So uh, this is a chance to see some real inside civil war uh, that most people don't know a great deal about or don't see a whole lot of. Um, before we get started, what I would like to do is uh, recognize our hostess. Um, Karen Needles is the uh, directrix of the um, Lincoln Archives Project, which is a labor of love that she's been working on for uh, 25 or so years. Uh, she has a wonderful website, uh, which if she's really quick, she'll throw it. She's, she is quick. Uh, take a look at that and take note. Um, there's a lot of neat stuff on this. If you haven't been there before, go do it. Uh, she's, she's got a lot of scans. She's got interesting things up there. And uh, the site is free. Now, having said it's free, um, uh, I don't know how Karen continues to live, although she does a lot of... Um, archival work and stuff when the archives are open, research and so forth. She's got the Dakota Wars there, for example. That is the um, all the trial records of all the Indians that um, were um, tried and sentenced to death by Abraham Lincoln, or were sentenced to death after the uh, Dakota uprising of 62, the General John Pope was sent north to put down and within that, um, Lincoln commuted all but 38 or 39 um, uh, death sentences and uh, the largest mass execution in United States history took place in Mankato, Minnesota, uh, when Lincoln had the, the 39 that he did select for uh, the death penalty uh, to be executed a couple of days after Christmas, 1862. So it's stuff like this that is really neat. And I really encourage you to go take a look at it. And um, if you are so inclined, uh, Karen could always use a few shekels uh, 
it's not tax deductible, but um, uh, she she has to pay bills too. So help her out and get some stuff up there and um, and uh, enjoy what she's presented because it is a chance to go to the National Archives without leaving your house. Okay, that's all the advertising you get, Karen. Close it up. I'm ready to start. <laughs> But I do, I do appreciate Karen. I've known her for a lot of years and uh, we have worked closely together on a lot of things and, and I admire the work she's done on that. And uh, more than that, I admire the fact that she has um, uh, agreed to host all these, these lectures and so forth for us. So um, uh, kudos to you and here's to another good year, Karen. And uh, with that, I'm, I'm ready to get a start. So um, good evening, Steve, you back on? Yes. There we go. Uh, now, you folks, I'm sure you all are wondering how Steve and I have arranged um, a, um, a, um, uh, a, a phenomenon such as this, where Steve is sitting in the morning sunlight of uh, Sheldon Church ruins uh, uh, north of his home in uh, Buford, South Carolina. So, um, uh, Steve uh, will will not tell them how you have done this, other than to let them enjoy that. Um, it's good to it's good to talk with you again, my friend. Uh, it's been it's been a little while, and um, and I am just so excited that you're going to be um, uh, leading leading us out on the battlefields again. It's been been uh, too long, and uh, every time out there is uh, a trip enjoyed. Yeah, it should be a real fun tour. Uh, it took me a while to not only get uh, Sheldon properly placed on the picture, but then I have to reverse it so that when I raise my right hand, it actually, I see me raising my right hand on the screen uh, yeah. <laughs> versus everything being backwards. Uh, but yeah, this will be one of the stops during the uh, first day that we are actually following Sherman's trail. I'm not going to tell the story of Sheldon. I'll keep that sort of a secret until... Uh, we actually go to the site uh, when we start the tour, but it's a something that's been recently discovered and sort of changes uh, a lot of the old myths and stories about Sherman's march through South Carolina. Sure. Uh, just because this is the first time you and I have done a, uh, a Zoom interview and I, I'm looking at it, a lot of the people who have tuned in, there's a lot of folks on this who probably don't know you and don't know much of your background. Um, um, tell us a little, you know, couple quick short vignette of your uh, career and, and what, you, what you've done for the last uh, 20, 25 years that we've known each other. Okay, well, I, I, I grew up in Toledo, Ohio, and grew up during the midst of the centennial. So that really got me and all my friends sort of caught up in doing Civil War history and studying Civil War history, buying all the games watching all the TV shows. And I guess I've been real lucky. I've been able to stay with uh, the Civil War. And though it's not really my primary career, it is something I uh, spend a lot of time working with. Um, I went to Wittenberg University in Ohio. It, uh, while I was there, I studied under a fellow by the name Robert Harchie, uh, who worked actually on the Bicentennial at that time, moved on to uh, Bowling Green State University for my master's under Robert Twyman, who was an Avery Craven student, which made it sort of interesting. And then when I got done at uh, Bowling Green with my master's, now he was nice enough to let me sort of go wild with my master's thesis. So my master's thesis was actually on Battery Wagner and Morris Island in the 54th Massachusetts. Uh, he pulled out a book saying, well, you know, you could get your doctorate here at Bowling Green, but you know, a doctor from Bowling Green, I'd love to have you as my student. So that's not going to maybe get you a good job somewhere. So we pulled out the book, looked up all the existing historians. And the only one who didn't seem about ready to retire or die was Thomas L. Conley. And I had actually written my historiography paper at Bowling Green on Conley, because this was just shortly after he came out with the uh, book on Robert E. Lee. Now, I've never, never, ever showed Tom my paper on him. Uh, so I applied to the University of South Carolina and then was a Conley student at the University of South Carolina, where he, after a couple of false starts, 
uh, assigned me a study of blockade running because he always had this question he always asked all his students, did the South lose because of lack of bullets or lack of men? And so I got to prove at least they didn't lose for lack of bullets. And then from University of South Carolina, I accepted a job to run the uh, Paris Island Museum at the Marine Corps Recruit Depot Paris Island. And that's really been my primary job for the last almost 40 years. But it's, it's a type of job where I could run a museum where we do Marine Corps history, local history, which includes Civil War history. And then uh, also gives me time to uh, be an adjunct professor at the local university and then do tours with you. I think the first tour I did with you was a Wilmington tour. Ed Bars was part of it. You are right. It goes all the way back to about 1996 or seven, I think it was. Yeah. Yeah. Now, tell me, um, uh, what was, because um, Tom Conley, of course, is one of the legends of the, of the, um, uh, of the uh, Civil War community and when he wrote The Marble Man and of course he wrote the series of the um, On the Army of Tennessee, the two volume uh, series. Um, what, what was the biggest effect that Conley had on you and others? What, what do you think, you know, he's such a legend and you studied under him. Uh, what made him uh, the legendary person that he was and what, what was your impression of him? Well, as a professor, what he did to you or for you, I guess, whatever way you want to kind of put it, uh, is that he, of course, emphasized primary documentation, primary documentation, go to the sources, go to the primary sources. And then, of course, Tom was famous for, and especially in his Army of Tennessee books, is you find the letters or the reports written closest to the event. Don't believe what they're writing 30 years later. See what they were saying actually at the time of or shortly after the time of the event. And that, that's how he really pushed things. And in my case and, and others like Bill Piston and some others, uh, he basically turned you loose and expected yeah. you to do the job. He really didn't watch over you all the time. You reported back to him, told him where you were at and everything. But he allowed you to uh, really, it was all up to you if you sank or swim. Now, you know, I, there was one other um, aspect of your, of your career and experience that I think is important and I want to, want to put a spotlight on um, uh, because I know that, um, that you have worked with other of the, the noteworthy historians of South Carolina uh, history and so forth. Um, you have served uh, and rec been recognized at, at the state level and in certain areas. And I, I'm not inviting you necessarily to toot your own horn, but I want people to understand how well you understand South Carolina history and stuff. Could you, could you uh, talk a little bit about um, uh, some of the work you've done for the state and the governor's office and, and things like that over the years? Uh, basically, what I've been recognized by the state for, uh, by the state itself, by the Humanities Council, and then also the local statewide uh, Daughters of the American Revolution, it, it's just my, the tours, my writings, uh, my classes. Uh, a lot of it is around that, if you ask me to give a talk, I almost always accept. So. Uh, I, I really promote the history of, of South Carolina. Uh, I've worked very closely with a number of the historians of the state from George Rogers to Walter Edgar uh, to Alex Moore uh, here in uh, Beaufort, Larry Rowland, uh, all these individuals who together we, in fact right now we're putting on a myself, uh, Larry Rowan, and John McArdle. Uh, if you know John, who wrote The Confederacy yeah. as a Nation, uh, we're doing a five-part lecture series uh, for the local historic uh, Buford Foundation. And so we're talking about local history. We're talking about what's going on in, in Buford. So I'm, I'm involved in all sorts of uh, different aspects of uh, state history, I work closely with the South Carolina Archives and History Division, South Carolina Historical Society, and just a lot of different various and assorted groups. Uh, one last thing I'd like to focus, and then we're going to turn to Sherman. Um, 
Uh, you are also the author of a significant portion of a, of a, of a, was it a South Carolina history or a, uh, regional history that, uh, Walt Edgar was, was, uh, leading on, which, what part of the, the history did you write? Uh, uh well, we South did, Carolina? um, there's a three volume set of the history of Beaufort uh, County or Beaufort district. And the first volume takes you up to 1861. And that was done by Dr. Rowland. And then he invited me because uh, he was asked by the University of South Carolina Press to do another volume. And so he asked me to do the Civil War chapters. And he thought it would be about three chapters, uh, 17 chapters later. Uh, <laughs> and 10 years later, uh, we finished it. So it, it, it's called uh, Rebellion. Uh, and come on, Steve. Uh, anyways, it's volume three, history of uh, Beaufort County, or volume two of history of Beaufort County. I did the Civil War chapters of that. Okay. Uh, in in all the work with with South Carolina, um, you know, everybody talks about Sherman's march to the sea, and and uh, we've we've covered that before. But now you've got you've got Sherman. He's got supplies. He's got the city of Savannah. He's got 60,000 men in and around uh, the city. Uh, William Hardy has left and conceded the area to him. Why does Sherman come north? Well, he comes north to continue what he had uh, started in Georgia to break up the Confederacy, you might say, from the inside out. Uh, not necessarily go after. In fact, just like he did when he went through Georgia, he will avoid hard, tar hard, tar target. I'm sorry, hard targets in South Carolina. Uh, the idea of being destroy the railroads, destroy the logistics, destroy the arsenals, uh, and some cases here the uh, printing areas for the Treasury Department, destroy the cotton. Uh, to convince the Southern people that they might as well give up this war. You're not being protected. There's no one guarding you and no one can stop me from marching completely across South Carolina. I mean, there was that instance uh, when it was suggested that uh, Sherman shift his entire army to Virginia. I don't think the men would have gone for it. They, they could barely handle taking the boats from Savannah to Beaufort much less uh, getting on a boat and going from Savannah all the way up to Hampton Roads. Uh, they, they were quite uh, upset about having to take those boats even for sort of a half day ride. Uh, these guys from Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Missouri, they, they didn't like the ocean. Uh, they were more of the type that would march through the piney woods. But uh, Sherman uh, saw this and then he's going to establish his basis. That's why I'm sort of starting to, I want to start the tour in Beaufort, which is something we haven't done before because this was where his right wing, the Army of Tennessee. A lot of people don't realize this, uh, but you know, this Sherman was commander of two field armies. Uh, in this case, the Army of Tennessee, which was commanded by Howard. Uh, there'll be the right wing, and then you have uh, Slocum commanding the Army of Georgia. That's going to come out of Savannah across the Two Sisters Ferry. That's going to be the left wing. And he has to not only coordinate the two wings, but then Slocum and Howard have to coordinate the two corps that each of them have in their, their particular armies. So at, when we come to Beaufort, uh, we'll discuss about the transfer first of Blair's 17th Corps coming to Beaufort and then later Logan's uh, 15th Corps. This isn't the... People expect, you know, think of this as this machine, finally oiled, keeping to a scheduled movement across South Carolina. It's far from that. And we'll get into that as we go forward. Uh, between the slowness of some of the commanders, the weather, uh, obstructions of flooded rivers, uh, it's going to be sort of fits and starts as they go uh, across South Carolina. And we'll, we'll talk about that when we, we come to Beaufort. But our, our first day, when we go to Honey Hill, what makes that sort of fit in is that it ties back to Sherman's march through Georgia. Uh, Sherman thought he would be outside Savannah by November uh, 30th. He's about a week off. 
but of course you don't have the communications that you have today. So Foster, the Northern commander at Hilton Head is going to sort of go with what Sherman directs him to do and tries to break the railroad between Savannah and Charleston around November 30th, 1864. And that leads to this battle of Honey Hill. Foster thinks Sherman should be hearing the noise of the battle. Uh, Sherman's still up there by Millen, Georgia. Uh, and so what you have to give Foster credit for, and uh, we'll, 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 we'll do a little tour around, is that he keeps the campaign going. Even though he's defeated at Honey Hill, he shifts over and tries to break the railroad at Tula Finney, and he stopped there. But he keeps the pressure up on the Confederate lines of communication, this Charleston and Savannah Railroad, so that you, know, you have Hardy and Savannah he has to keep looking over his shoulder. It's what's going on in South Carolina. And then when Sherman gets close to Savannah, General Williams, the 20th Corps, begins shifting part of his corps into South Carolina, possibly to link up with Foster's men and trap Hardy in Savannah. And that's going to cause Beauregard to come down. He's going to meet with Hardy and they make the plans and eventually evacuate the town and fall back into South Carolina. And then that is sort of the setting. Uh, you know, we'll talk all about that. And then we'll, we'll sort of might say set the stage at Honey Hill, where some of these guys who have been for almost a month uh, out, a lot of times without the proper equipment in the field, suddenly hear fifes and drums. And here comes portions of Sherman's army on the roads and link up with them. And then Sherman has to wait another two weeks before he can even begin his invasion into uh, deeply into South Carolina. Did you, you know, you mentioned the Savannah Charleston Railroad and of course, um, from the very, from November of 61, when, when the, uh, the Union Army comes in, takes Port Royal Sound and, and Hilton Head and has this presence uh, that, that orients around the sound, uh, the, the key consideration for Lee and subsequently for Pemberton and others was the maintenance of the Savannah Charleston Railroad. That seemed to have been what, what got um, uh, Pemberton in deep trouble with, uh, with the uh, South Carolina politicians. When Hardy gives up Savannah, do you find, what, what, what does he do with his forces? What's is there a, a, a firewall in South Carolina? Is there uh, a serious thought that they're, that they're going to defend the state or has uh, Hardy's authority just completely dissolved when he leaves Savannah? Oh, no, his authority is still, still very strong. Uh, he pulls the most the, the garrison from Savannah back into South Carolina. Now, your Georgia militia, they have to come into South Carolina, work their way back up to Augusta. But a lot of the Georgia reserves and state line, they'll, they'll continue to serve uh, in, in South Carolina. But what Hardy does, and, and he knows what he's supposed to be doing, he's supposed to be guarding Charleston. So he pulls his men back uh, along what's uh, referred to as the Cumby River. And uh, already before they evacuate Savannah, they're building defenses along the Cumby River. And we've seen some of those in some of our previous tours in the yeah. area. Fairly impressive set of earthworks along the Cumby River. It's got two divisions, uh, Tolliver's Division and Ambrose Wright's Division. And they're, they're the ones who are watching uh, the Cumby River. Uh, so, no, he's still in charge. He's still very much locked into defending Charleston. Now, this becomes a problem, and we'll talk about this as we go on to our tour, is that Beauregard, once past a certain point when Sherman goes into uh, South Carolina, is going to direct Hardy to evacuate Charleston, get up here to Columbia. I mean, he's not going to Charleston. Get up here to Columbia, where we can possibly link up with elements of the Army of Tennessee and meet him here at Columbia. Jefferson Davis countermands that order. So that then forces Beauregard to evacuate, uh, order the evacuation of Columbia. Uh, I mean, Hardy is in charge, but he's also watching, you know, taking his orders uh, from, from Jefferson Davis. It is interesting now, there's a lot of criticism of Lee at this time, and you can 
be critical of Lee or even say, well, what in the world is he really going to do? That Lee didn't send more reinforcements down to South Carolina. Um, and Lee's in a tough spot. I mean, he, how, how much can he possibly, if he can, weaken the Army of Northern Virginia? Uh, the remains of Kershaw's brigade uh, will arrive down here, but they're, they're good fighters, but there's not very many of them. Uh, some of the South Carolina cavalry units, uh, the exchange uh, between some of the ones that are worn out and some of the ones that have been around Charleston go up to Virginia. Uh, but Lee, uh, but Beauregard's very critical of Lee because he believes Lee should have been sending reinforcements uh, while the railroads were still operating to Columbia. Uh, that that would have been something that Lee should have done. Uh, and even I think the same day that uh, when Beauregard's replaced by Joseph Johnson, <laughs> Beauregard is also writing another critical note about Lee. Why didn't you send any men down here? Uh, so as we do this tour, we'll not only be talking about logistics and seeing a lot of interesting sites and the movement of the troops, but also the politics and, and, and what's occurring and how that affects the campaign as a whole. Sure. Now, you, you, you raised an interesting point when you talk about Lee and his, um, and his situation in, in the trenches in Petersburg. Of course, if Lee is to handle this, and, and, and what remains of the Confederate infrastructure once Sherman has moved to the coast, uh, the, the innards of the Confederacy are, are very, very tenuous, and they're, they're fairly small. They go out of Richmond down to Danville and down to Salisbury and, and uh, uh, Charlotte, and uh, there's a prison camp in, in Florence, which um, I think is, is part of the the run, but I think it's Charlotte. Where does the railroad go from Charlotte to Columbia? Or yeah, does it, it goes straight from Charlotte to Columbia. So there was a direct route. There were actually two routes to Columbia. The quickest would have been through uh, Danville down to Charlotte, uh, then down to Columbia. And then the other one was sort of a roundabout way, uh, which you would have gone to Florence and then uh, come in uh, to, from the east into Columbia. On I-20. And just just straight uh, on in. Uh, no, it's actually south, well south of I twenty. Uh, still oh. there, the, it's still the, the railroad's still there. It, it's not on the same uh, bed as it was in the Civil War. It's about 10, 15 miles north of the Civil War bed. Uh, but we'll talk about that. We'll see. Well, we won't go to, but we'll talk about how these bridges, uh, railroad bridges that were built over. The watery swamp, the Congaree swamp, will be actually destroyed by the Confederates before the Yankees even get there. But uh, all of this is sort of the logistical movement that Sherman's carrying out. And he does keep the Confederates guessing. Now, Mike, is he going to Charleston or is he going to Augusta? Uh, when he first starts out, yeah, he could cut across to Charleston. Uh, one wing of his army is on the Georgia side of the Savannah River. They could go straight up uh, to Augusta. And then Sherman's uh, right wing could have swung over and come to Augusta from the east. Uh, so it, it was like sort of a guessing game as where you defend and what is the more important area. And again, we'll talk about this when we go to Beaufort's Bridge, which is uh, will be on the first day. It's one of the most beautiful set of Civil War entrenchments that anyone has ever seen. And it's on a private plantation and you can you can walk down, they've rebuilt part of the causeway across the Salkahatchee River. And if you yeah. close and you feel like you're back in 1864. I mean, you're suddenly there's no civilization around you whatsoever. But Broxton Bridge was the main headquarters for McClaws because if Sherman crosses there, he has a straight line to Charleston. So that's what they're really going sure. to be trying to defend. Um but again, they don't know what he's going to do. And I guess this is the advantage. And Wade Sokolowski talks a lot about this as well, is that, you know, you've got these four cores all operating independently and you don't know where they're going. Uh, sure. and the Confederates are trying to double guess and the Confederates have maybe one half to one third of the men you have. Uh, it, it's, it's tough. It's tough. Well, you know, it's, it, it's fascinating because, uh, you know, if you look at the geography of the of South Carolina and you look at where uh, Sherman steps off from, uh, it, it really is 
you know, I, I remember in, in Virginia, Robert E. Lee, when he comes back from South Carolina in March of 62, he just believes that McClellan is only going to Norfolk. He's going to the shipyard. He believes that, that Burnside's going to come up through the dismal swamp. Uh, and he can't see anything other than that because militarily it makes the most sense to him in the world that that's what's going to happen. When Sherman looks at South Carolina and you look at what's left of the Confederacy and you look at the people who are defending South Carolina and looking at this threat that's going to emerge and come their way, you've got these two really contrary or contrasting, but either one is a very attractive plum. Charleston, of course, is the is the moral epicenter of rebellion and making that that city and, and taking that city and having it fall certainly would seem to be a very worthwhile objective. And I think Dudden Sherman plays that, uh, that insecurity with Charleston, but he also teases uh, the possibility that he's going to Charlotte, that he's, that he's going to go in and come in from the other side and basically close this off. And um, uh, I think it's very, very interesting the way he does that. Um, if you're looking at it from the Southern point of view, what, what was Lee's and Davis's greatest concern about Sherman? Where did they, where did they think Sherman was going? I don't think they ever figured it out, to be honest, where he was going. Uh, they initially, this is something that Lee, throughout the war, and it, it kind of filtered down to subordinates, is that um, you know, terrain is going to slow people down. Uh, the, the winter, the floods, uh, and I think it was what Joseph Johnson said, if I would have known that uh, Sherman's army was going to be marching across uh, the swamps of South Carolina and building and the corduroy and all their roads as they go. There's never been another army since Julius Caesar has done this. Uh, I think they counted on terrain. Uh, and also, I think, of course, as Davis always, I don't say it's illusionary, but Davis always, and you had people in South Carolina here too, calling for people to return back to the army. I mean, even before Sherman started his march into South Carolina, uh, over, you know, I don't know what the figure would be, one third to one half the Confederate Army was absent from the ranks. And you see appeals not only from Jefferson Davis, but all the way down to local South Carolina level for troops to return to the Army. Uh, but then again, if you where you return, where do you go with them? I don't know if Lee really put that much thought into what was occurring uh, he, you, know, he, you know, Lee very much was defending Richmond, Petersburg and Richmond, uh, even though he was the commander in chief by this time of the Confederate Army. So uh, uh, he still did what Davis told him to do. And they thought that maybe the movement of what remained of the Army of Tennessee would be enough to stop Sherman. Uh, but even then, those units coming across, they didn't know where to send them. Some went to Orangeburg, some went to Augusta, some went to Columbia, some went to Charlotte. Uh, and, of course, the railroads of the Confederacy just couldn't uh, bring them all together at the same time to one point. It just just didn't work. And, of course, Sherman ripping up railroads as he went uh, just exasperated the situation. But I, I, I don't – It's that's an interesting question of how much did Davis and Lee really – think they could do other than you suddenly have all these pantheon of uh, confederate generals and not enough men to try to stop sherman as he's coming through south carolina and at no point did they ever consolidate until you get into north carolina did um uh what what do you think uh the main reason for sending wade hampton back to south carolina was do you think it was more of a recruiting uh, maneuver, or did um, did they expect you know, Hampton was a was a tremendous fighter, and one wonders whether or not coming back to South Carolina might he have a, have actually attacked Sherman coming through, or do you think that perhaps he was just there as a South Carolinian to try to rally people back to the to the flag? 
A little of both. I mean, I, I don't know how you always hear the stories that he was uh, set down so Fitzhugh Lee could then become commander of the cavalry at the Army of Northern Virginia. But uh, Hampton came down here. Uh, he was uh, came down here with a couple divisions of cavalry. Uh, wasn't much left of them. They actually was sent uh, cavalry units down here and they would have to uh, find their own mounts once they got to South Carolina, which was, was rather difficult. Uh, he was a, a rallying uh, individual for the state of South Carolina to bring people together to try to resist Sherman. Uh, he did as best as he could. Uh, it was very difficult for him to keep Wheeler in line. He was he, he was uh, Wheeler's uh, superior, though. You you see what Wheeler does. It's oftentimes uh, Wheeler never really followed too many orders. Uh, I think again, it, it it was sort of an illusionary part of uh, Lee and Davis. Is okay, we'll send Hampton down there, and you know this individual will be enough to rally the South Carolinians. South Carolinians are pretty played out by this point in the war. I mean, we're talking a state where 50 percent of anywhere from like 40 to 50 percent of the South Carolina troops are dead. They die in this war. Uh, and then, you know, you have that you're wounded and you're maimed. Uh, I mean, South Carolina, as much as people uh, really attack the state, they put everything they had into really trying to defend the, the Confederacy. So yeah, you, what you've got left down here is 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 not a lot. Is not a lot. Um, and even if you had released all the South Carolina troops from Lee's army, that'd just be a drop in the bucket. Yeah, it wouldn't even. I mean, it, it wouldn't even come close to matching a division of Sherman's forces. When you look at uh, when you look at the march, um, uh, what what were the greatest challenges uh, logistically or transportation wise specifically that, that Sherman's uh, two armies faced uh, and where, where do you look at something and just say, my God, how did they do that? Oh, it's a number of areas uh, that, that it occurs. It, it's uh, the, the ability of these troops to build bridges, to create roads, to cut through marshes and swamps. Uh, Slocum has the hardest task because the Savannah River is well over flooded. So the main road he needed to to uh, move up to Two Sisters Ferry to cross over uh, is flooded out. So he has to double back and go around. And then they can't even uh, figure out, and it takes them a while to even figure out how are you going to lay the pontoon bridges across the Savannah River. And that was quite a feat in of itself. I mean, this is not a slow moving river. Uh, and the South Carolina side was flooded and they had to build bridges from the end of the pontoon bridge up to, the, to some high ground. Uh, that was probably your greatest logistical feat. And I don't think Sherman gives uh, Slocum much credit for doing this because uh, Sherman's already uh, a little farther up into South Carolina. And he's complaining, where's Slocum? Slur Slocum. And they're even trying to bring out uh, Slocum's nickname from Gettysburg, Slow Trot, uh, to mm -hmm. see you know, what, what's going on here. And even the aides, the Sherman, are asking, you know, well, we, we were all very worried about it. I've never seen, uh, you know, General Sherman this upset. No one dare even talk to him tonight because he doesn't know where Slocum is. But Slocum had a tremendous, uh, you know, great difficulty to try to get across the, uh, so just to get across the Savannah River. And then literally had to spend a couple of days drying out his soldiers once they get across. And then, then this is the same place where they cross the river and suddenly uh, landmines start blowing up on them. So, really? Yeah. So it, it's, it's a, not only, uh, you know, just, uh, in terms of the terrain and the weather, but just uh, some of the nasty warfare uh, that's thrown out in, in, in front of them. Uh, it's, it, it, it's, uh, that is probably was the greatest logistical feat. And the uh, sort of an interesting sidelight, the U.S. Navy sent a warship up to uh, help Slocum cross the river. And a, and a little double ender, and her commander was Stephen B. Luce. Really? 
Yeah. And so Luce, you know, goes on to be the founder of the Naval War College, is actually helping Slocum get the pontoon bridge in place and across because they were afraid the Confederate vessels would come down from Augusta to attack. Uh, I mean, this was not an easy thing for Slocum to do. To me, that was probably the greatest logistical uh, problem. Then when they get after Columbia, uh, they find all these rivers in the upper part of the state flooded and they literally are delayed for about a week. Uh, before they could move on to Shira. And we'll be uh, coming along down some of these rivers to where the bridges were located, uh, some areas, uh, sites that really nobody goes to these days and, and show where uh, the, uh, uh, the forces cross. Uh, the crossing of the Watery River or the Catawba River, and that's because it changed its name right about where the left wing crosses. That was a mess too. Uh, just it's, if you remember, it's a huge slope all the way down to the river. That's right. Just all mud, and then you had to put the pontoon bridges in and go up the other side. So it, it's there's logistical feats and and what how these engineers, the pont uh, fellows who ran the pontoon bridges, uh, the black soldiers, uh, though they technically weren't soldiers yet, uh, were the pioneers for Sherman's forces. Uh, what they did as they went across South Carolina is just just amazing. And at the same time, we'll see some of these. The Confederates are throwing up earthworks all over the state to try to stop them. Uh, problem is, he just goes around them. And a lot of these earthworks are still there, uh, if you know how to find them. You question, um, with, with the South collapsing economically, because you know, there's no question about it, and Georgia's gone now, and Savannah ports are going away and, uh, you know, they've, they've lost uh, uh, Wilmington. So there's, there's really no ports left open to them and stuff. The, um, what remains of the Confederate uh, manufacturing infrastructure? Um, I know certainly there's aspects of it in Augusta. There's a fair amount of stuff has been moved to Columbia, uh, there, there's bound to be stuff on the line that runs along what's roughly I-85 now through North Carolina towards Salisbury, Charlotte, Salisbury, and so forth. What, what if anything, does the, does the Confederacy still have that is essential for them to hold on to or to try to hold on to in the wake of or in the, um, uh, in the presence of, of Sherman's onslaught? Well, you still have the powder works at Augusta. Now, if you can get that powder anywhere, it, it's, it's difficult to do. You still have all the great foundries in Macon. And, and we don't give the Confederates that much credit for rebuilding the railroads themselves. It yeah, takes them longer. They're kind of jerry-rigged. They have to pull up some uh, lines from elsewhere to get the main lines back in operation. But even after Sherman passes through South Carolina, some of the railroads are rebuilt by the Confederates. Um, so there, there's still an attempt, but the, how do you get them? You can't get anything really from Macon or Augusta to the Confederate forces in North Carolina. You, you, you just can't, can't get them there. And yes, there are factories uh, in uh, central North Carolina, but not with the output that these other factories had. And even Charleston is still, until they evacuate, is a major uh, spot for uh, making cartridges, and other ordnance equipment. You know, you, you, you raise a point that after Sherman passes through, I'm always impressed by the fact that after a hurricane goes through, it seems like the prettiest weather always takes place after the storm has passed and you get gorgeous days. But the storm comes back to South Carolina after Sherman goes in the form of a man named Potter Tell us about why uh, Potter um, is dispatched by Sherman after Sherman enters North Carolina. Yeah, you know, when Sherman, uh, again, this is again sort of his, I uh, just reading this, uh, I think yesterday, uh, Matthew Butler, uh, uh, when Sherman, after he goes past Columbia, uh, he's sending out words that, oh, no, now Sherman's going to head for Florence. And then head up to Wilmington because he's running out of supplies and he needs to be refitted. So, again, they, they thought he might head with the whole army to Florence once he reaches Shira. He doesn't, of course. But when Sherman moves through, there are certain enclaves 
uh, within South Carolina that have not been touched yet. And a lot of them are based around these various railroads uh, that uh, feed from Florence down to Charleston or over to Columbia. And there is a lot of rolling stock uh, supply trains in, in this, this region uh, around Sumter, uh, South Carolina, Manning, South Carolina, uh, around Camden, south of Camden, South Carolina, area that the town doesn't exist anymore, but it's called Manchester, South Carolina. And Sherman just sort of basically sends back instructions uh, to these commanders in uh in Charleston, uh, Gilmore takes over, but then there's other commanders who have different districts uh, to move up into certain areas to destroy more of the railroad lines. Uh, like he doesn't touch, Sherman doesn't touch anything between Charleston and Columbia. So some raids go up into that area. And then Potter is going to Edward Potter. He's Brigadier General, interesting fellow. He was sort of a, uh, somebody always sponsored by General uh, John Foster. And served with Foster in North Carolina and Tennessee, and then comes down here, was at Honey Hill. A fairly competent commander. He was a, a lawyer. And he's going to be, and he's done these raids before. He did them uh, when we did our tour in North Carolina. He carried out these tours from New Bern into the interior of North Carolina. So he's given a force uh, to sweep through an area from really Georgetown inland uh, he's going to hit King Street, Manning, Sumter, sweep up the Camden, Manchester, Statesburg uh, to destroy these railroad lines. And it's just an incredible amount of rolling stock and locomotives that are in this area, uh, not to mention uh, thousands, if not tens of thousands of slaves will also be carried out uh, from this region as well. And so we'll be picking up his raid around Manning, South Carolina, follow it uh, to Sumter. Um, and there's a wonderful diary. We'll be following this, uh, Captain Stevens's diary uh, of, of the raid uh, and follow it from Sumter to Manchester up towards Camden and back to, uh, uh, we're gonna go to Dinkins Mill and uh, uh, Dingle Mill and then Boykin Mill, all these little battlefield sites uh, that occur. And uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's a really fun little tour. Uh, it, and it kind of gives you a good feeling for what's left of the Confederacy. I mean, they're pulling guys out of hospitals, uh, guys who are home on leave, uh, convalescing from wounds. Uh, Stephen Elliott, who's already shot all up, is going to be involved in trying to stall these uh, units. Uh, uh, and it's just... So they have no way they can possibly, even the Orphan Brigade of Kentucky will be involved in this, uh, trying to stop Potter's raid. That's Stephen Elliott's the same uh, uh, man of Elliott's salient uh, at the crater, isn't he? Right, yeah. He, he, was... he has survived that only to come back home and, and find himself defending against Potter. That's right. interesting. Let me ask you this. Um, uh of course, the uh, the most dramatic aspect of um, Sherman's marches, and and it is a it is a matter of uh, unquestioned faith among the Southern uh, partisans that Sherman was a brigand, and that he um, uh, randomly and and without mercy or any soul destroyed the South and made war on civilians. Talk about the war on the civilians as uh, the Army of Georgia and the Army of, of um, uh, Tennessee move, move north. Yes, excuse me here. <clears throat> um, yeah, it's, uh, it's different from Georgia. Uh, in Georgia, the, the line always is that the people stayed in their homes. And if you stayed in your homes, even in South Carolina, your homes weren't burned. Now, Columbia is going to be a home different story, but on the march itself, uh, if uh, the South Carolinians uh, abandon their homes, and if it's abandoned home, the soldiers are going to burn it, just, just going to burn it. They, in some cases, you have accounts of them being encouraged to burn them by the uh, slaves, you know, what Masa coming back. Um, the Most of the civilians are fleeing from in front of Sherman's forces, 
there's not a lot of interaction between the uh, civilians. I mean, there's some, and you know, there's some horrible stories, uh, though they're they're not, you know, they're not murders and rapes or things like that. But there are where uh, civilians are very badly treated and roughed up. Uh, as the soldiers are looking for goods and uh, buried treasure uh, or just uh, being a crazy frolicsome 18 year old and cutting up uh, bedding and being very destructive as he goes through a town. But uh, and we'll talk about some of these areas or some uh, and we'll go to Winsboro for one spot is where we'll talk about some of the things that the soldiers did there and some of the interaction between uh, the bummers not so much the guys who were uh, part of the main columns it's going to be uh, and, and, and you can even argue uh, is it all the bummers or not or is just people uh, guys taking advantage of, of going out uh, onto the side, but I mean, well, I'll show you houses that survived, uh, that have survived uh, uh, Sherman's March. Uh, now, Columbia is going to be a whole different story, and we've got Tom Elmore, who is now the top historian for the uh, burning of Columbia. He'll do the Battle of Congaree uh, Creek and the burning of Columbia, and he's, he's uh, an excellent tour guide and, and just knows this inside out. And we'll probably have some discussions as to, you know, you they picked Wood's division to garrison Columbia. That might have been the mistake right there. You should have chosen Hazen's division because Hazen would have had a much stronger hold over uh, his troops than Woods did. Uh, who knows? I mean, that's a speculation. We really can't can't look at that. But uh, uh, Tom will talk about uh, what happened in Columbia. We'll, we'll uh, try to make arrangements where we can see where Sherman actually may have slept. They put by by the story, slept on a rock in the middle of the river while his troops were going to cross over into Columbia. Uh, then you have uh, Wade Hampton in Columbia when. Uh, uh, they evacuate the town and one end of the street is Wade Hampton. The other head of the street is are the Yankees coming in. Uh, so Tom will give us an excellent tour of that area. And there's a lot of stories about interaction with civilians there. Uh, good, bad, and indifferent. Now, did you find um, uh, in, in your consideration of what happened in South Carolina, do you think that um, that what the Union soldiers did was excessive to the requirements or was it consistent with the attitude of the soldiers? I've heard that um, it's been written that uh, the soldiers acquired a newfound discipline once they got back into North Carolina. Um, was there a revenge motive? against South Carolina, in your opinion? Probably somewhat, uh, though I've seen, I, I could argue that uh, once they were past Columbia, they, they really ceased a lot of their destruction. Uh, and again, it would be nice to map out what was actually destroyed, what wasn't destroyed, because Sherman does go through, for at least from uh, here, uh, until you get up uh, towards Orangeburg, a, a fairly uh, not not a very uh, highly populated area, an area that is uh, not you don't think of as the grand mansions and things of South Carolina. In fact, Sherman's men remark that most of the people they're finding are poor whites. The um, you we we've done this program before, and I have my. Uh, my opinions, but I, I, I'd like yours. I'd like um, the the aspects that we do on this trip that you just when you did it, you 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 just yourself said, "Wow, this is this is really cool. This is stuff that most people just don't appreciate ever ever happening." Where where are those spots on this trip and? And uh, which are the ones that are the biggest wows to you and why? Yeah, it's, it's an, they did a study of Sherman's March, the South Carolina Archives and History did. And it's interesting, there's 
uh, and we're, we try to follow where you can actually see something. There, there are spots where there's nothing to see where Sherman's armies pass through. And unfortunately, in some cases, the roads don't exist anymore. I've just sort of yeah. disappeared. So what I, I try to do is keep us on roads uh, that are either are the roads or very close to the roads that the federal forces marched along. And again, some of the wow, what's in my, behind me here, Sheldon Church, uh, sort of outlined the initial movement of the uh, Federals into South Carolina. I've already mentioned Broxton Bridge, but it's one of the most spectacular sights you will ever see. Then going up to Rivers Bridge, which is one of the best kept little battlefields uh, in the United I agree. States. Uh, and we've got Dan Bell, who is the greatest expert of Rivers Bridge to do that tour. He works for South Carolina Parks, Recreation and Tourism, but it's just a beautiful battlefield. The state has done uh, an excellent job, mainly through Dan and, and the work that Dan has done in interpreting the battlefield. Uh, then from there, uh, we'll, we'll move up towards Orangeburg. And a lot of people don't realize, but in Orangeburg is uh, though it's something maybe Blue and Gray needs to help out with is Sherman's headquarters, not in the best shape anymore. Uh, and uh, but we'll pass by some uh, river crossings. We'll see some uh, entrenchments as we go up. And then uh, what I like about this tour, too, is then the first night we'll be stopping at the uh, South Carolina Relic Room. And Joe Long will be doing a tour primarily concentrating about the Civil War and Sherman's March. And, you know, you'll be able to see Wade Hampton's sword and uh, Butler's sword. And they actually have relics and artifacts from the march at, at, at the uh, relic room. And then the next day, of course, uh, Tom Elmore, I'm real excited about being part of his tour and, and this Congaree Creek, if nobody has seen Congaree Creek Battlefield, it's a battlefield just outside of uh, Columbia, uh, where the Confederates tried to get stall Sherman's movements. And just it's been recently timbered. So the battlefield looks much like it did at the time of the battle. Oh, that'd so, be cool. Yeah, so you yeah. can actually look down this road and wow, it, it, it's a state park. It's sort of a combination, uh, archaeological, prehistoric, recreational, civil war park. But uh, there's um, magnificent entrenchments there. And, and now with the clearing of the battlefield, you'll be able to get a good feel for, OK, down there's the Confederates. You can see their lines. Uh, and some really strange things happened at that battle. If you can imagine a Union regiment charged, realized they couldn't get across the creek. So under enemy fire uh, by the flank, moved down to where they should be and then charged. So yeah. I, and my one friend said, I've never heard of that occurring in the Civil War battle uh, before. Uh, Winsboro is a place that very few people really go to, but it was where really both wings of Sherman's army swung through. And there you'll see the difference between, you might say, the Army of Tennessee, the Westerners, versus the Army of Georgia, which were mostly the Easterners, the guys who had been sent east uh, to help out at Chattanooga uh, after the Battle of Chickamauga. And again, it, a lot of this action with, as you mentioned, with the civilians depends upon which units, uh, who the commanders were, uh, what were the background of these units were. And then Shiraz is just a gem. Uh, Isn't that a gorgeous town? And Every got, time. Yeah, we've got Sarah Spruill is going to be there. So she will be doing the tour for us. Uh, and we'll, we'll do a complete tour of that. Then we'll swing through Bennettsville, see uh, the headquarters for one of the Army Corps commanders before we swing down to Florence. At Florence, uh, some sort of little hidden things that we'll, we'll pick up on. Uh, remains of the uh, gunboat PD. Uh, her propellers are at the new Florence Museum, uh, and I'm going to see if we can get in to see them. And then the cannons taken off the PD, they've been preserved, and we'll pass them on the way to, uh, uh, to the uh, prisoner of war camp. And I... I'm going to try to hold him to us. He said he would be there, but Dana McBean, who has done a great deal of work on that prisoner of war camp, is supposed to meet us there and talk to us about the prisoner of war camp at Florence. And then, well, Potter's, yeah, then Potter's Raid is just uh, these little battlefields that there's, they're small enough 
that you might think they're insignificant, but they're small enough that you can actually stand there and understand exactly what happened at these battlefields. And then ending at Milford Plantation, where Potter's Raid actually did end, is this a fitting uh, termination of our tour? Well, you know, what's, what's also fascinating with this is that, uh, you know, I've been doing this for 28 years now, and um, I've, I've done a head count. We've taken people to over, over 600 different battlefields around the world and so forth. The Civil War Sites Advisory Commission had listed the 396 some odd essential battlefields and so forth, but What's fascinating to me is all these smaller sites that when they did this Civil War Sites Advisory Commission, they never really paid attention to areas like Potter's Raid and Broxton Bridge and places like that. And so something like this, you're actually getting to go see the rest of the Civil War, the the stuff that wasn't big enough to make the big the big headlines, but nonetheless was certainly significant. It was very significant to the people who died there. And um, I just think it's, it's really is a, is a fitting tribute to um, the soldiers who fought the civil war and the people who experienced it, the civilians, um, the, 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 the military people, the politicians, it's, it's just a really fascinating wrap up. So I'm really excited that we're going to do this. Um, you know, as as happens with these things, the time goes really quickly, and we're just a few minutes before nine now. But I will, if anybody would like to uh, ask a question or whatever, please just go ahead and raise your hand, and we'll uh, I'll ask Karen to unmute you all, and um, we can maybe take a couple of questions uh, for Steve. Um, and, uh, if not any questions, um, I, I hope we have, we have awed and dazzled you to the point that either you're, you're brain numb or, uh, you're just, uh, still taking it all in. And one thing I left out and I don't, and, and just got confirmation on this is we will have a civil war tour of Camden. Uh, and we'll and so you'll be seeing there's uh, great debates and fights over where exactly did Mary Ch Chesnut uh, put together her diary or not. So we'll be seeing some of those. We'll see the uh, the uh, grave, the Quaker graveyard there where Kirkland's uh, buried. Uh, and then we one evening we'll be able to go to the new center, historical center in Camden. It's primary revolution now, but it is in the rebuilt Joseph Kershaw house. Hey, uh, Steve, Mike Hill, I think, Mike, I think you're up in Baltimore, if I'm recollecting. Um, Mike wants to know, uh, how much uh, was desertion a problem for the Confederates um, moving through South Carolina and elsewhere? Uh, it was a tremendous problem, uh, though they never called it desertion. Desertion, again, these legal terms, you'll need Bill Davies to explain these to you, but uh, they would just say you're absent without AWL, absent uh, without leave. It was the main problem to Confederacy. If you call someone a deserter, that then means you have to go through sort of a legal process with that individual. If they just sought to be absent from the ranks and they come back, you can declare amnesty and so on. But by this time of the war, uh, I've seen as high as three quarters of the uh, Confederate Army is absent from the ranks. And that's why you have Jefferson Davis calling for people to come back. Uh, I think even his uh, proclamation from Danville calls for uh, people to come back to the Confederate armies. And then, you know, with just, just even half of you come back, we can defeat the Federals. I got kind of in trouble with that because, uh, and I did my uh, book on blockade running. My argument was, again, they had plenty of arms and equipment. They just ran out of men. And I was attacked in the newspaper. We even called upon the Klan <laughs> to visit me for suggesting <laughs> that the Confederate soldiers would be uh, leaving the ranks. So I had to literally quote Jefferson Davis in my reply 
uh, <laughs> but uh, it was tremendous. The, the problems with desertion was just tremendous by this point in the war. Not desertion, again, absenteeism at this point in the war for the Confederacy. Sure. Uh, any other questions, guys? I'm, I'm about uh, tapped out for tonight, but um, if anybody's got a question, let's see. We've got one. Um, Scott has asked a question. He says, um, can uh, you speak to Wade Hampton wanting to mount an attack on a portion of the right wing as they were isolated from the, from the left wing? Does that uh, register with you, Steve? Well, I mean, they always were looking at trying to strike at one wing or the other. Uh, Hampton, I'm sure, called for it on a number of occasions, but it, it, he just was not in a position to do so. Uh, and it, it's just sort of like, yes, lo logically, that's what we need to do. Hit one wing and then hit the other. But he never was in a position to even contemplate such an attack. Uh, even even up around uh, just north of Columbia? Which... Even north of Columbia. He was already falling back towards uh, Charlotte. So that really would have been the left wing he would have been looking at. Uh, the Confederates never uh, were able to put together a counterattack in South Carolina. I would have thought uh, there, it was seemed to me to be somewhat intimidating especially as the uh the two wings of the union army uh came closest together uh just north of columbia i think that if if i were going to hit i would have hit much lower down i i think that the the spectacle of 40 50 60 000 people would have scared the hell out of me if i were <laughs> a guy who wanted to survive the war I, I just don't know that I would have. And and it looks to me, quite frankly, that um, uh, Confederate opposition, such as it was, really had um, crumbled a bit. By the time Columbia goes, I think the the uh, Confederates are lickety split out of the state. They, they've had enough. Yeah, they're split. I mean, you by the time they evacuate Charleston, you've got Hardy at Shira. Uh, you've got elements of the Army of Tennessee with Johnson and Beauregard uh, south of Charlotte, and uh, mainly at Chester. Uh, I mean, you're talking a wide swath of territory between these operative units that they just can't coordinate. Uh, and then you have Wheeler and Hampton operating somewhat in between. And even the cavalry gets scattered out. Uh, some are screening Florence. Uh, others are just watching the advance and others are screening possibly any movement uh, northward into North Carolina. And then you have Kilpatrick running around up there. And, and we will also go into the story about Kilpatrick and was he really with Mary Boozer or not? <laughs> We'll hold that for those people who want to hear that. Uh, Steve, um, I'd like to thank you very much for, um, for all you have done for Blue and Gray over the years and you continue to do. You've, you've not only been a good friend, you've been a loyal member um, for a lot of years. And uh, I appreciate the fact that you take your checkbook out and you write us a check every year and support what we're doing. It means a lot. It's a real pleasure to work with you. Uh, this is going to be a great program next month, and I, I hope that um, uh, we'll add, I think we've got um, seven or eight people registered already. I hope we'll, uh, we'll double that because I think people will be very, very well served to uh, join that tour. So uh, with that, thanks very much, Steve. If you would be willing to hang on maybe for, uh, for uh, 10 minutes or so, we'll see if anybody wants to talk to you offline. And if not, then we'll get off and go home. And for those of you folks who um, want to see this again um, or think somebody else ought to see it, uh, Karen will probably have this done and up on the website by the first part of next week. So uh, we'll let you know. Okay. With that, um, uh, we'll say good night. And um, uh, Steve and I will be up for about another 10 minutes if anybody wants to ask. Okay. I'm reading all the little comments on the side there.
Oh, good. So you can see those as well. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good, good people. Good crowd tonight. I, I think um, uh, Karen said we had um, about 24, 25 because uh, we had people come bouncing in and, and so forth. And I saw a lot of um, good folks, including some of the folks who are going to be on the tour with us already. I saw Corky Lowe and some other folks there. So um, so I think good, good audience tonight and um, points well taken. Um, Karen, I, if, if you'll let the folks, anybody who is, um, still there and, um, uh, I, I see Gary Brand and EC Honeycutt and the Fletchers and Don Johnson, who I haven't talked to in a, a long time. So if, um, yeah, if they're unmuted, can, they can unmute themselves. Okay, folks. Uh, if you go up to the top where your thing says you're muted and you want to talk, you can unmute yourself and, uh, and pitch in. Um, uh, if we don't hear anything from you guys in a few minutes, uh, we'll check out. So um, uh, you are, you're, you're good to unmute and, and uh, speak up if you'd like to. Uh, Len, what are you going to send the uh, South Carolina chapters for the Revolution Tour book? Uh, let me find out what's happened to him because uh, uh, I've got an editor and I just got a question from uh, from them. Uh, they said they were running a little a little short on on fact checkers and stuff. And I was surprised I got 25 fact checkers. Uh, yeah. So so let me go back and I will uh, once I come off this line, I'll send that over to um, uh, to. Um, Mike Kennedy, who's the editor, and uh, I'll send you an info copy of it as well, sure. because uh, we've got to get some of those things done. And uh, about half the book so far has been, in fact, checked. We need to get the other other half done. So, so, okay, calling, calling, last call for people. Uh, anybody want to speak up? Okay, if if not. Uh, Karen, come on up, and we can go ahead and uh, and we can go ahead and wrap this up. Thanks a lot, Steve. All right, Steve, real pleasure, and um, I'll be in touch again soon. And um, uh, Karen, as always, thank you very much for a good time, and um, we'll see you next week um, uh, when um, Paul and I will be chatting. Okay, okay. Good night. Okay. Talk right. to you later on. Bye bye.